Ring, 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 ring. Somebody get the phone. Banana phone? Banana phone! So I checked out a few minutes of Mo Moe's ma'am. I ate your pie. It looked like he was ready to kill Spike Vegeta, which is understandable. I mean, I would think that was everyone's default reaction. Really? Yet, Why was he so dude, ready to kill? I don't know. He just sounded like Spike was just making a lot of loud noises, and Pine's like, I don't know why we're laughing. <laughs> I was like, yeah, Well, you chose. You chose him. <laughs> you made. You, you enabled this. You enabled this. You I said, Ah, oh, Spike Vegeta. Now there's a good. Now there's a good friend. He might be a good friend, I don't know. Now there's a good streamer, there we go, that's a genuinely untrue statement. More level. One more! Pat, when are you becoming a VTuber? I thought that was your, that, that's your backup, right? If you didn't uh, get a job? You're gonna become a VTuber? No. Well, I thought you said, you know, dozens of people have offered you rigs because they said you'd be the best VTuber ever. I don't think I, anyone has ever said that. You did say people have told you to be a VTuber. I think you're lying. No! Talon remembers. Talon, you remember. It's like, my friend tried to give me a model once. Pat said this. Yes, this is a very real thing that I definitely remember. God, you can't rely on the senile person for backup. <laughs> You're the one who tried. You're the but only you other sure person the here. Senile? No, Pat definitely said this. Well, you can't rely on Q because he'll just say whatever. What the? So who else is gonna get to back you up? Well, no, I could rely on Q because he would he would just lie if it meant a more outlandish story. You'd say, "Yeah, Pat tried to get me to become a VTuber." Yeah, my friend who is a VTuber leveled a Venusaur to level 100 in Viridian Forest. Oh God! If half, if half of Q's stories are true, like forget Florida, man. We should be talking about Texas person man woman relative hey what all right give me a seaweed please weed Anybody heard anything from Toby Fox lately? I wonder if he's... Is he done? Is he done yet? Is he done with Delta Root? I wanna play... I wanna play Delta Root. You're drowning. Go avoid drowning. No. I was trying to get sea, seaweed seeds. But if none wants to spawn, then I will just net lose a seaweed seed. That's fine by me. Oh, I do need to go back down there to give uh, the leprechaun his dibber back. As one might be wont to do. Strawberry. Take your dibber back, Mr. Leprechaun. I don't want it. I don't get that strawberry. You may not have strawberry. Strawberry bowls? Oh. Are those spikes or not? They're spike vegetas. Oh no. Oh yes. Do not spike vegeta. Freeze a spiked Vegeta. Mm. 
God dang, you get so many god dang birds nests from these high level bird houses. Hi, I say high level, level 50 bird houses. Son of a babby, that's high level to me. God dang it. Like how as soon as you put seeds in the birdhouse, like a dead bird shows up in the in the entrance. Like let's zoom in and see this. Okay, empty empty birdhouse. I put some seeds in. Bam! Immediately a dead bird. <laughs> Can't explain that. Why is the bird dead though? Is this bird alive or dead? How are we designing these birdhouses to kill like dozens of birds over the course of an hour? Do I need the jellyfish? Look at those beautiful tea trees, and they're all mine. I planted those. They're my teaks. Burning them down with no survivors. No, stop. Oh, that was a freaking pathetic birdhouse hall. I mean, a billion nests, but are nests good for anything? I do not know the answer to that question. Birdhouse. When do I make an, when do I make the next tier birdhouse? Level fifty nine hunter. Hunter, hunter, gotta find that hunter. And I'm at level fifty two. I can catch eclectic implants now. What are those gifts? Do they give anything good? Blue dehyde chaps. Those are pretty good. One out of a hundred, though. I'm gonna pass on that one. Nature implants for 58. Ooh, now that's what I call. Magic logs, I would like those. Magpie at 65. know all that stuff. Why not? Alright, let's do this quest first. Mithril axe. I need to go buy that. Five iron bars. Well, I can grab those. I have iron bars, go speak Emmy. Uh, there it is. 20 Ecto tokens, I have five.
just need a leather. Not sure I have any of those anymore. I have to go kill a cow. Yep, no leather. Holy symbol and polished buttons. Well, I definitely have holy symbols. What's a polished button? Oh, you obtain them by polishing regular button. What the frick is a button? Oh. What the heck? Okay. There. Polished. Edfil Monastery. Okay. Might as well get him to bless two of them, one for myself. Uh, and then I just need to get that Mithril Axe. Boots of Lightness. Oh, God, there's a clown. Holy symbol. Oh, it's so holy. Okay, now I gotta go to the woodcutting guild, which I think the fastest way to get there is go to my house.
by your finest mithril axe, sir. Okay.
east. Hey, let me show you a funny clip from an old British cookery program. Food and eating and drinking is conducted around a table. Around a table, conversation takes place. Out of conversation, ideas are born. Out of ideas, plays, festivals, and theatre is created. Why couldn't we do that here? Anyway, I digress. I'm sorry I digressing. Actually, I enjoyed that digression. I'm going to have a little slurp, and then, if you'll be kind enough to come down to the important bit of the whole day's proceedings, are these lovely scallops. Imagine if the good people at the British Broadcasting Corporation crossbred James Bond with your favorite grandma, who cooked but also drank and swore a little too much. The issue of such a union would have been Keith Floyd, star of my favorite cooking show ever made, Floyd on Fish. It seems to be a terrible thing to do to your family, but I always wanted my mother-in-law on one of my programs. And it's taken me 25 years to catch her, actually. My man with the mother-in-law jokes. Classic. Not the kind of thing you could really say on television nowadays, nor should you, perhaps. But then again, even the original viewers in 1985 would have wondered, how did this make it on the telly? There's a drunk man standing in front of a single handheld camera, and he just doesn't seem to realize this is actually going to be broadcast without much editing. Tell you what, if you just hold there a minute, you just keep gazing at these, would you? Can you come in close? I want to get Erica a moment. Hold on there, you just keep looking at them. They're very beautiful. Erica, could you spare a moment, please? Erica. Oh, why is that? You, I'm sorry to interrupt you. You couldn't come to. Uh, she was spared from the undead curse, and now she is trying to eke out a living as a farmer. In this undead hellhole. I had to try to get her, uh, undead boyfriend, or not boyfriend, husband, to give me the passcode to their bank account. <laughs> and he said he won't tell me, because only a, only a scammer would ask for a bank pin number. You're not a scammer, are you, Talon? You wouldn't want me to stream the bank pin number, would you, Talon? I am not a scammer. But it's okay, you can trust me. Okay, one, two, three, four. Traitorous leopard noises. No, you were supposed to be the chosen one. No, it's okay, I'm on your side. Oh, okay. I wonder if that guy still makes those comics. Need to check Probably on this. It does occasionally. What is it called? Looking at a site always felt like a super mega comics. A super mega comics. Super mega. Looking at a site always felt like I was gonna get a virus. I wonder what sound a giraffe makes. Hey, look, there's a giraffe over there. How convene! Giraffe sounds! Welcome to Giraffe Sounds World, a dimension you travel to whenever you hear giraffe sounds. My name's Greg. Gireg. Ha ha ha. Is a third one. I'm an idiot. Agreed. Fuck. Wait. Why not? I can shortcut the trip back. Use my ecto vial. Ha ha, I'm a genius. Delightfully devilish, Ivan.
Ah, oh, there's a carpenter in the cupboard. Please help me. I was building the house and then I realized I built myself into the cupboard. Looks like Super Mega Comics still got it. Except it doesn't, uh, they don't have dates on them. Yes, it's, uh... There's a page, they have a Patreon. Just my name, what the heck is a sweater? Also do ongoing storylines like Planet to the Moon and bring in guest artists. Super Mega's website has no ads, so if you enjoy Super Mega, this is the best way to support it. What do you get for a dollar a month? A ghost chasing a zombie chicken. Bonuses like really old unreleased comics, teasers, sketches, alternate versions of comics, process videos, un unfinished comic scripts that I drew into a comic anyway. Super Mega Comics is on hiatus. Sad. Rip. Looks like it stopped September 2022. <laughs> Was something else. your kitchen could you because what I'd like you to do we've left you a dreadful mess here come around look at Erica because this is her kitchen we've ruined it all morning we've trampled over the lawn we've abused her oyster farm we've drunk her wine we've used her electricity and gas and all I've got to offer you is either and the choice is yours one of my muscles or a big kiss oh which will you have a big kiss oh. thanks Alison. she looks comfortable who is this madman, and who gave him his own show? Please, allow me to sing for you the ballad of Keith Floyd. Our man Floyd was born during the war, 1943, in Reading, England, or outside of Reading, and his parents were totally working class, but they did scrounge up enough money to send him to Wellington School, which is a public school, and by public, of course, the Brits mean private school. Wellington is not the fanciest of such schools, but it is perhaps where Floyd learned some of his upper-class airs, and where he got a peek at the good life enjoyed by richer classmates. Actually, nobody's life was that good in Britain at the time. This is the era of endless, grim, post-war austerity. This is the era when British food obtained its reputation as just being greasy gray stuff that's poured out of a can. And of course, by can, I mean tin. After a stint as a cub reporter for the Bristol Evening Post, Floyd joined the army, inspired, he says, by the movie Zulu, even though Zulu came out a year after he actually joined the army, which he actually did do. He was a tanker and he cooked a lot. Discharged in his early 20s, Floyd went back to Bristol, where he worked a series of menial restaurant jobs, eventually worked his way up to sous chef at a fancy hotel restaurant. But 
being the silver-tongued hustler that he was, by the time he got to his late 20s, he owned three restaurants in Bristol. They all failed. I cannot track down the provenance of this photo that I found online, but I'm pretty sure that's him around this time. Floyd just drank way too much to run a restaurant properly, and he had a tendency to do things like he'd, he'd stumble into the dining room and declare, all drinks on me, darlings, and that was not sustainable. His marriages tended to follow a similar pattern, five wives. Anyway, he took whatever money he could salvage out of the three restaurants, and he got himself There's on a yacht and there. sailed around the Mediterranean for a while, and eventually he tried to make a fresh start with a new restaurant in the south of France. Good morning. It's a very, very early morning, but the sun's shining and we finally made it to San Marlo. Excuse me if I'm looking a bit rough, but the crossing was, you know, a bit heavy. Anyway, look at the Yeah, his French mm -hmm. restaurant failed too, but Floyd came back to Bristol as an evangelist for British consumption of British fish. An astounding amount of British fish was ending up in French markets at the time, as British cooks didn't really understand or appreciate it. And all of the crabs that are here all come from England, from Devon, from Somerset, and Cornwall coasts. That's what our fishermen are doing. We're not eating it. The French are. But well done the British fishermen for providing it anyway. Once the 80s rolled around, Floyd had a somewhat successful restaurant in Bristol. He had a cookbook out, and he'd been noticed by a BBC producer named David Pritchard. This was a good development for Floyd's career, though probably not his health, as Pritchard was a fellow big-eating, hard-drinking man. The pair of them would swing into a new town, drink it dry, and then the next morning they would try to film a cookery program, still obviously pissed, as the Brits would say. We're going to take a superb fillet off here, running the knife, hopefully, up the bone. I'm sorry. I have just done that completely the wrong way around. You must always start filleting a fish from its head and run with the flow of the fish. But I'll do it properly from here on in, and before I do that, I'm gonna have a little slurp because I'm a bit nervous today. Yeah, if you care about your health, don't live like Keith Floyd. Consider instead doing a full body intelligence test with Viome, sponsor of this video. If you watch my videos, you know that scientists are nobody knows a test shipped with my link and code in the description, or snap the QR code. Thank you, Viome. Anyway, Keith Floyd. Before Keith Floyd, cooking shows in Britain were presented by the likes of Philip Harbin or Fanny Craddock. They had a slight zany energy, but they were still pretty sober affairs. There is nothing sober about the seven episodes of the original 1985 Floyd on Fish series. Shambolic seems like an appropriately British descriptor. In this bubbling, fishy, fun-filled program, I'm going to tell you the mysteries of the Buir base, how to improve your sex life, and explain the contents of my little black case, okay? And I'm sorry for the cock-up earlier, but now I'm going to get down to the serious business. If you want to watch, you're very welcome, but I can't really spend too much time with you at this precise moment. Don't look at me, I'm trying to explain the food. This is a food program, you half-wit, come back. I'm sure Floyd actually was fun to work with at times, but his act did tend to run thin on people. He's the kind of guy who just takes up all the oxygen in the room and that could make things awkward whenever he had to share the camera lens with another human, as in this episode with Rick Stein, who became a celebrity chef himself after this rather rough introduction to television on Floyd's show. So you've all got that at home, those ingredients. In fact, you could use any root vegetables you fancied. This is Nick's own very special recipe. Rick, dear boy, Rick. Rick! Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Just well, once you've seen one cook, you've seen them all, haven't you? Producer David Pritchard would eventually break up with Floyd and get into business with chef Nick what Stein. The fuck? Remember that British TV series are generally rather short little one-offs. There are seven episodes of Floyd on Fish, and that's it. But one series was enough to make Keith Floyd a star, and he ended up making a lot more. If I'd carried on eating fish like I was doing in the last series, I'd have developed fins by now, and actually I'm bored to death with fish, and I want to get back to a bit of simple peasant cooking and some red meat. I have to say, by this point, I think Floyd had already jumped the shark. He just got more and more self-indulgent and high on his own shtick. Through it all, he continued to drink and get divorced and make terrible business decisions. This clip is from around 1990. The, the restaurant business and cooking is a, is a pretty expensive sort of disease. Yeah. It's, a, it's a drug. And uh, after several, after about 13 different establishments, I vowed never again. I've got this wonderful job on telly. Don't have to see customers ever again. What did I do five years later? Opened a pub, which um, 
which is silly, but on the other hand, it's a nice break from the otherwise sort of semi-globe-trotting, luxurious life that, I, that I'm fortunate enough to lead. Hey, who else is in that shot? Why, it's young Marco Pierre White. This is from one of Marco's first series, simply called Marco. Oh, that's it. A drop of water, my dear. Only in Britain do you hear a pair of certified alpha chads calling each other my dear and darling. I love it. Floyd's alcoholism was, in fact, no laughing matter, but he laughed about it anyway, as in this clip from Irish television, Kenny Live. Floyd used to call his hangovers the wrath of grapes, and he identified three distinct hangover types, the double whammy, the time bomb. And then there's the third one, which is the creative hangover. That's when you do get back to work and you think everything's absolutely fine. The yeah. truth is, in this instance, you're still stumpy. <laughs> Intoxicated. <laughs> so those are the three principles. So you think you're doing fine, but everybody knows. Uh, you think you're doing fine, but everybody else knows that you can't. And I mean, a quick short Yeah, line. Floyd was not fine. His boozy later years were spent shooting additional TV series and running additional restaurants into the ground. He lived in Thailand for a while, Singapore, or France, where the actor Keith oh, no, Allen tracked him down in here. 2009. He shot oh, a documentary yeah. there called Keith Meets Keith. James, can I have a drink, darling? Although Keith's first love is French cuisine, he still adores those childhood tastes. So I'd bought him some very hard to obtain comfort food from England. Right, Keith, I bought you some Haywood's Piccalilli. Fantastic! <laughs> How about this? Corned beef. You're looking at a man who is only 65 years old. That's what a lifetime of smoking and boozing does to your face, kids. Keith Floyd died of a heart attack the night this aired on Channel 4, reportedly as he sat down to watch himself. Marco Pierre White told the BBC a little piece of Britain had died with Floyd. Alcoholism isn't fun, but God help me, the original Floyd on Fish series really, really is fun. And it's preserved on YouTube, thank goodness. Clear your calendar and go watch the whole thing. Though it's also sad to think that Floyd's evangelism for British seafood may have contributed to the decimation of wild fish stocks in the Northeast Atlantic. Cod was Keith's favorite, and according to the conservation nonprofit Oceana, nine of the region's cod stocks are depleted, worse than any other fish. Add that to the list of reasons why there will never be another Floyd on fish, nor should there be. It's time to move on from the days when a man would dress up as if for the opera, consume food and drink to dangerous excess, and get handsy with the ladies in the kitchen. He offered her a muscle or a kiss, and she actually chose the kiss, so I'm guessing she was actually into it. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Make and run a website for 10% less moolah by using my link and code in the description. When I was a child, this is how my New York Italian-American father and grandmother made pasta. Cooked pasta on the plate, sauce on top. I naturally thought that's just how it's done. Then when I was a teenager in the 1990s, we got the Food Network and I saw chef Mario Batali do this instead. Take it out about 30 seconds to 45 seconds before it's the al dente that you want and cook it in the sauce so the two separate ingredients, the noodle and the sauce, come together as one. Watching Mario Batali do that was the first time I became aware of how significantly Italian food and Italian-American food had diverged in the centuries since impoverished Southern Italians flooded into New York en masse. That wave of immigration included my great-grandfather from Bari, who, as family lore would have it, sailed across the sea clutching a little fig tree from the old country, a fig tree that he then planted in the back of a row house in the Bronx, and it was a tree that I visited many times in the process of visiting my spinster aunts who lived in that house until they died. And my little tree here is a clipping of a clipping of a clipping of that tree. Now, I love Italian-American food culture, and I'm quite glad that it has developed the way that it has. But when I watched Molto Mario as a teenager, I could swear I felt it pinging something in my Jungian collective unconscious, and it set me walking down a path that I'm still on. Now is as good a time as any to acknowledge that Mario Batali is, at least, guilty of serial sexual harassment, to which he has admitted, and at worst, he's committed sexual assault, which he denies. This is why Batali no longer owns any restaurants and why he is no longer on TV. 
How should this paint our experience of his old shows? That is a question to which we shall return, but for the moment I want to talk about Molto Mario on its own terms, as the made object that it is, regardless of what its host was doing off camera. Molto Mario debuted in 1996. Sabatali was 32 years old, and he had hardly done anything in his career yet. He'd apprenticed all over Europe, come back, and opened a small trattoria in New York called Poe, but that was the extent of his empire. The more significant thing he'd done is impress powerful people with his unmatched gift of the gab. I'm going to play you a minute-long clip from a 2004 episode of Molto Mario called Bankers of Torino. We're talking about La Cucina Piemontese. That's right, the cooking from the Piemonte, which, if you're familiar with it, is in the far northwest corner of Italy. It's protected by the Alps, although it also has the Alps. So it enjoys a very interesting microclimate, somewhat passed over by many of the cool breezes, but still enjoying a nice, cool climate in the fall and a relatively hot Mediterranean-like climate because it's right next to Liguria. It's famous for making beautiful vermouth and a lot of great wine grows in Piemonte, perhaps the most famous of which is Barolo and Barbaresco. Today we're going to make three dishes, a minestrone, a tagarine, and a beautiful chicken liver dish, all three kind of representing some of the riches and the local products that make regional Italian cooking so delicious. The first step, of course, Mario Batali's logoreic riffing on regional Italian foodways was impressive enough when he was just standing there in his signature orange clogs. But then he would keep at it while simultaneously blasting through at least three dishes in a half-hour show. When the Arabs brought rice and first introduced it to the Sicilian culture in the 8th or 9th century, it was actually cultivated there up until the middle of the 18th century. And what happened, for some reason, and we do not know, is it dried up a little bit in Sicily because when you're... There's at least two different things happening simultaneously in that clip and indeed in Batali's brain. The gabbing part of his brain is going on about historic Sicilian agronomy, while the cooking part of his brain is thinking, oh crap, I'm burning the butter on national TV. Gotta turn the heat down and get the rice in there, stat. With the notable exception of Alton Brown's rebooted Good Eats, there is clearly nothing remotely this erudite on the Food Network anymore. And there's certainly nothing as raw. This genre of cooking program was often referred to somewhat derisively as Stand and Stir, and it was shot like an old-fashioned multi-camera sitcom, more like a stage play than a movie. A set lit up as bright as the surface of the sun, thus enabling cameras to shoot with small apertures and ultra-deep focus. Imagine being a camera operator trying to keep this whirling dervish inside a shallow focal plane. At least three cameras, I think, simultaneously shooting different angles of the action that unfolds in close to real time. Vitaly would often sprint to the finish with his final dish in the last 10 seconds of the show, while an off-camera producer no doubt frantically tapped the imaginary watch. A touch more cheese and a little bit of toasted breadcrumbs, and there you have it. A beautiful lamb cacio e uova. Thank you guys for being here. I want to thank you. I want to thank you guys for being here, and I look forward to seeing you on the next Molto Mario. Wow, that's a beautiful thing. A good stand-and-stir cooking show is to the Food Network as the music video is to MTV. Ancient relics of both institutions' respective original purposes before mission creep led them to trashy reality competition programming, apparently the entropic end stage of all TV. What am I going to have to do, hire a beaver to chew it? Anyway, perhaps the greatest testament to Batali's ceaselessly spouting well of smart-sounding stuff to say is how little his guests ever spoke. Their job was to sit on the stool and occasionally giggle, despite those stools being perpetually populated by a who's who of New York high society, always introduced with merely their first names. My name's Mario Batali, and this is Molto Mario. I'm here with my good friends Ken, Christy, and Michael, and today we're talking about the basic pasta sauce primer. Yes, that's freaking Michael Stipe of R.E.M. Simply introduced as my friend Michael and almost never heard from or acknowledged again in the ensuing episode. What an epic humble brag for a TV show to do that. I'm here with my good friends Naomi, Jake, and Maggie. Yes, that's freaking Maggie and Jake Gyllenhaal. Just my friends, Jake and Maggie. Epic humble brag. But in a way, Molto Mario really was humble, in a way that I can see now in retrospect profoundly affected the way that I cook and eat. Batali constantly underlined that most great Italian food is born of poverty, and that's part of why it's so good. What you'll find traditionally in this largely agrarian society is that most often we're just using plain old ordinary water. And that's one of the reasons why when you taste these soups, they're going to be something that are so redolent of just the simple pleasure of exactly what's in it and not this murky broth made with the feet of some other animal. It 
Devotees of my work will detect some resonances in that clip. No! Batali constantly underlined that great Italian food is about making the best of what you have where you are. As a result, the best way to cook Italian is often to not cook Italian. The most important ingredient in a beautiful carbonara is guanciale. If you could hand me that there, Brooks. If you can't have trouble finding this, there's a place called Bialese in New York, and probably they ship it. But also, there's a lot of great, really high-quality American bacons around. And just go out and buy one that's in a slab so that you can cut it as thick as But beyond Batali himself, the format of Molto Mario the show necessarily steered it away from the arrogant, presumptuous prescriptivism that I abhor in other cooking shows. Somebody like Gordon Ramsay is constantly going on about the the proper way to cook the most amazing whatever it is, as if there is objectively only one legitimate goal and only one way to get there. Molto Mario rarely traffics in such prescriptivist claptrap because its format is inherently descriptivist. Batali isn't saying this is the right way to do it, he's merely saying here's the way they do it in this part of oh Italy. God, Take so what fast. you will from that information. Does it really make a difference doing it that way instead of in a bowl? Word well, this that. is the way they do it in Italy, Ken. If we'd like to do it the way you do it at your house, it'll be the Molto Ken show. No, for what it's worth, I have tried to embody that same approach in my own work. I would never presume to tell you the proper way to make pasta. I just tell you how I like to make pasta and how I came to discover that that's the way that I like to make and eat it. And in the process, I hope to inspire and empower you to go on your own and journey of self-discovery. Indeed, I have come full circle on pasta. I've kind of been loving my sauce on top again lately. I love the heterogeneity. Every bite is a little different because you can dose the sauce onto the noodle yourself in innumerable ways. I hate food where every bite is the same. Likewise, I would never presume to tell you whether you should watch Molto Mario knowing what we know about Mario Batali's personal conduct. I'm not going to be the guy that's gonna say, oh, you gotta judge the creation and the creator independently, or oh, you gotta judge people by the behavioral and moral standards of their time. You don't gotta do anything other than what is right for you. But for what it's worth, I will now walk you through some of my own thought process on that subject as it pertains to my own habits of consumption. The first thing I will acknowledge is that almost no one is blameless in their personal conduct. Certainly not me, and probably not you. Most of us are quite lucky that we have not as yet come to be defined by the worst things we ever did instead of the best. On the other hand, if, if there exists a problem of people being too quickly ejected from public life for behavior that is as common as it is harmful, surely that problem is much smaller than the problem of the behavior and the real harm it causes to real people. People commenting on this video that I'm making right now will no doubt debate at length whether Batali's admitted and or alleged sins should render him permanently persona non grata. But let's assume for the sake of argument that they should, that Batali is beyond redemption. Oh, the assault allegations could certainly nudge you towards such a conclusion. Let's just assume that for a sec. Should that stop us from enjoying a really great TV show that the guy used to make? Assuming you even want to watch it, maybe you don't, knowing what you know about the guy. But let's just assume for the sake of conversation that you do want to watch it. The question of whether to patronize... Bread, pie, any kind of cake, any kind of pizza. I don't have any of those things. Oh no, I have a cake. Got a cake! Candle. Now it's time for. I need to get a candle. The heart side. That's <laughs> Oof. Willow logs, maple logs, oak logs, log logs, uh, pick desk. Soft clay, coal, 
Moons to cast Firebolt, Fire Blast, or Wing Wing. Oh, okay, I can do that. the wares of a bad person is much easier, I think, after that person is dead. Richard Wagner may have been a proto-Nazi, but he's dead. All his operas are in the public domain, so I'm not going to be financially supporting him and his proto-Nazi agenda if I buy a ticket to go see Das Rheingold. Mario Batali is still alive, and therefore still stands to benefit from my consumption of his products. Or maybe not, because Molto Mario is, as far as I can tell, only accessible in these pirated videos on YouTube. Plans to commercially re-release the series were reportedly scuttled after the allegations surfaced in 2017. I'm not sure if he is making money from these vids, though I suppose I'll find out if and when this video of mine is flagged for copyright, despite being exactly the oh kind boy. of thing- free XP, baby! Of knowledge. 675 free or more. The US Congress envisioned when they codified the fair use doctrine. But anyway, it bums me out that most ship? of Malta Mario is, for the moment, lost in the mists of time. It bums me out that the creation must be banished with the creator. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, maybe that's the way that it needs to be. I'm just saying that it bums me out. And it bums me out for all of the other people who worked on that show. Almost nobody is gonna watch The Cosby Show ever again, and I understand why. Who wants to watch a convicted rapist sanctimoniously model the role of ideal family man? But Bill Cosby isn't the only person who made this show. For dozens and dozens and dozens of other people, this show is their life's work too. For some retiree out in Queens, being a gaffer on The Cosby Show was the most important thing he ever did in his career, and now that record is expunged. As someone who worked for years as an invisible producer on other people's shows, that bums me out. Maybe the best way to escape this sticky wicket is to not live in the past. What was good about Molto Mario can simply inspire others to make something new and better. It has obviously inspired me, and who cares if the Food Network is a reality trash heap these days if we have things like YouTube? You want a smart cooking show with an ultra gregarious host? Go subscribe to Helen Rennie. Okay, okay, enough about wine. Let's talk about me. Where would your salad dressing be without me, huh?
you know, your right mustard. Man, I love her. Or make something of your own that you would want to see in the world, which is exactly what Squarespace can help you do. You don't have to be a trained computer scientist like Helen is in order to make a beautiful functional website. Squarespace handles all the technicals, allowing you to focus on what oh you have to say to the world, which is fundamentally what a website is all about. It's your storefront, whether it's a personal portfolio site or a literal store with which you can sell things while Squarespace Welcome to Bloomington, Indiana. Like many large college towns, this town has a fantastic restaurant scene. Here's a story about restaurants that you might have heard before. The modern concept of the restaurant was born in Paris around the turn of the 19th century, the Revolution. Cooks who had previously been employed in the kitchens of great aristocratic households, well, they suddenly found themselves out of work when said great houses lost their heads. Insert guillotine sound effect. In the sudden absence of any more princes to serve, these incredibly skilled cooks created a whole new industry, serving instead the general public out of a storefront instead of a private kitchen. In the Western world, at least, that is the origin story of the restaurant. And serious works of scholarship repeat that story all the time. Is it true? Kinda not really, says Dr. Rebecca Spe- Why did I dash? I don't have a chisel. I don't have a chisel. Bang. 
professor of history here at Indiana University. Specializing in the history of 18th and 19th century France, and I wrote a book called The Invention of the Restaurant. In a new and updated edition, in bookstores now and linked in the description. So there are a number of problems with that old story about the birth of restaurants. The first being that the first recorded restaurants were not in France. The first known restaurants weren't even in Europe. They were in Asia, specifically present-day China, Song Dynasty. Like half a millennium before restaurants showed up in Paris, they had them in China. I mean, they didn't call them restaurants because restaurant is a French word, but they were restaurants. In um, what we would call the 12th and 13th century, um, a very vibrant urban culture with hundreds of thousands, I mean, the biggest cities in the world at that point were in that part of the world. Um, and writers from that culture describe menus of endless up. length. Um, and great sophistication. And menus are one defining feature of true restaurants. Neither the Chinese nor the French invented selling prepared foods to other people, despite the fact that both the Chinese and the French have a tendency to claim they invented just about everything. No, civilizations all over the world have ancient traditions of cooking food and then selling it or otherwise distributing it outside the home. I mean, the great majority of people in the course of human history didn't have their own kitchens, didn't have dining rooms. Uh, so either people were you know, peasants eating what they had, perhaps cooked in the single room they had, or more likely, if you're thinking about an urban setting, uh, people did have to eat from street vendors, from taverns. Indeed, the modern food truck is simply the latest incarnation of a truly ancient business concept, street hawking. And yeah, modern food trucks have menus because they've been heavily influenced by the restaurant industry, but historically speaking, that probably wasn't the norm. It was more like, here's some food I cooked. Do you want to buy some? Yes or no? Those were the two choices on the menu. Yes food, no food. Dr. Spang says it's a similar story if you look at the history of other pre-restaurant eating establishments. Imagine you're a traveler. I'm traveling right now. I'm visiting Bloomington, Indiana, because I used to live here a long time ago and I get back to visit every now and then. I really like it here. Anyway, imagine you're a traveler in a historical context. There's no hotels for you to stop at when it gets dark at night. So what do you do instead? Well, you try to keep to heavily trafficked paths and you might come across a house that has some extra rooms in it. And if you've got a little bit of coin in your pocket, you could rent one of those rooms for the night and get yourself a meal. You would have sat down at an inn with everybody else who was staying in the inn. And all the food would have been put on the table at once. And it would have been what we today would call family style. There's no menu. It's whatever the innkeeper cooked that night. You can either eat it or not. Same deal with drinking establishments, which urban areas all over the world have had since forever. Taverns, pubs. Historically, such places might have also offered some food, but not a menu. There's one joint of mutton in the corner. You can either have some with your ale or not. That isn't a restaurant, even though modern pubs like the Irish Lion here in Bloomington have basically evolved into sit-down restaurants with vestigial bars attached to them. Same deal with tea houses, coffee houses, very old institutions, but not restaurants, at least not originally. Le Petit Café in Bloomington is run by this adorable no. old French couple who settled here decades ago, and despite the name, it's a restaurant, not a café. Historically, in France, a café is a coffee house. A restaurant is a place where you sit down and order a meal, you get a choice, and then you get up and you leave, all right? Where a café, you can hang around, you drink your coffee, maybe you drink something else, um, but the emphasis is not on the food. Um, right? They might serve food, but the point of going there isn't for the food. Even though lots of cafes today have restaurantified and become all about the food. Okay. We'll talk about the origins of true restaurants in a moment. My hands but are fucking if you're killing all about me. The coffee, <laughs> yes, that's what I'm saying! <laughs> Pat, you, uh, you at last, you truly see. Or? ...sponsor of this video, Trade Coffee. I think one reason I hated coffee as a much younger man is that 
most of the ostensible coffee houses in my world were just sandwich shops that also made bad coffee. And most coffee I got at home was bad because most coffee at the grocery store was stale. Not so now when I buy from Trade Coffee. I take their quiz online, I tell them what I like, and they connect me with a roaster who sends me something super fresh straight to my door. Not some global commodity blend, but in this case, beans from a car is off. You're speaking, inns are not restaurants, cafes are not restaurants, pubs are not restaurants, bistros are not restaurants. Bistros were boarding houses in Paris where you could rent a room and also get your meals for your rent. So what exactly are restaurants, according to Dr. Spang? The great innovation of the first restaurateurs is both in their menu, but in how they serve it. So there are separate tables for different parties, right, on the model really of a cafe, which is an institution for the earlier part of the 18th century. Separate tables, printed menus, so you can pick what you want, and they serve pretty much at any hour. Right. Oh, you're just going down. I'm an idiot. Meaning it's not a situation like at the inn where dinner is whenever the innkeeper gets dinner ready. If you miss it, you miss it. At a restaurant like the excellent farm here in Bloomington, you show up within a reasonable window of time. They sit you and your party at your own little table away from everybody else. They give you a menu with tons of options on it. You pick a few and then they cook or at least finish those dishes to order just for you. And they deliver them to your table like you're king for a day. That is a restaurant. And they had establishments meeting this basic definition like 800 years ago in Song Dynasty China. But then there's this whole thing where Song Dynasty fell and China kind of de-urbanized, arguably de-modernized for a while. Between that and the eventual European colonialism, a lot of modern restaurant culture in East Asia is a hybrid of Eastern and Western tradition. And the Western tradition developed independently in France, in Paris, in its own surprisingly weird way. Dr. Spang says it started before the revolution in France. Think about the word restaurant. Where does that word come from? In French, it comes from the verb se restaurer, which means to restore, to refresh. So the first restaurants, or really they were called the first restorers rooms, are opened in the 1760s and then in the 1770s in Paris to serve restorative dishes. Specifically, restorative bouillon, bone broth, just as bone broth has been a health craze in recent years, so it was in pre-revolutionary France, along with some other trendy health foods the first restaurants also served. Um, rice puddings, water from the king's well, uh, wine with special designations, all of those things that in the 1760s, 70s would have been very, very special indeed. And the establishments that served these trendy, expensive, therapeutic edibles operated a little bit more like health spas. 
Health spas have an ancient tradition of highly personalized, individualized service. Oh, come this way, Monsieur. I can see you're so tired and weary. Come over to this quiet table where you can be by yourself and rest. Here is a list of all of the therapies we offer. A person of your refined taste would certainly want to pick something specific, right? They're selling restorative bouillon specifically to those um, delicate, urban individuals. Now this one sucks.
My god, they were both liches. Sixty one crafting. This man's been crafting. Arrest him. Are you arrested yet? Yep. Okay, good. I have a camulet now. I can talk to camels. Um... Why would you ever want to talk to a camel? Talk to a camel. But why? Who's going to stop me from talking to a camel? Hmm? The that does not answer question. the question. That's a better question, though. It's a much better question. No, it's an inferior question. Alright, so that's another quest down. The Garden of Death. Actually, let's look up Haunted. I think maybe Haunted Mind is next. Let's see. Maybe this is too powerful for me, but I don't think so. Apparently this guy's pretty strong. on that one. Mountain Daughter. What does this one do? Give... There's a lizard in my laundry room. What the heck? <laughs> I'm still working oh, through this backlog. Oh, I see. <laughs> Well, why not? I guess we'll do this one. Never 
know what I might need this amulet. Staff or pole? From the next Slayer Cave, Slayer.
Tom. who didn't feel inclined uh, to eat a big heavy meal. The first restaurateurs advertise specifically that they cater to those who are not in the habit of eating an evening meal. So anybody, right, so you, the first restaurants are places where you go out not to eat, but to delicately sip your bouillon. Now, why would you do that? Like, if you don't feel like eating, why do you go to a restaurant? You go to show to your friends, to the people at the other tables, that you are so sophisticated, so um, sensitive, would have been the 18th century word, that you can't really tolerate the sort of heavy meals that other people are eating. Right? So it's a sign of social distinction, social sophistication. What happens in the course of the French Revolution is that that kind of marking of social distinction is no longer what we in the 20th or 21st century would call politically correct. So the restaurateurs have to change things up. And instead of saying that they cater only to the finest people, to those with delicate appetites, instead they say, ah, we make all dishes available to all honest Frenchmen. Um, so it's a complete inversion of the kind of audience to which they were trying to appeal. So yeah, that's the true and much weirder origin story of the Western restaurant industry, according to Dr. Spang's research. The innovation that really stuck wasn't what they served at the first restaurants, but rather how they served it. Individual tables, show up when you want, get a menu, choose from many options, have it prepared to order, pay your bill and get out. Is there any truth at all to the old story about private cooks losing their jobs when their masters got the chop and then all they could do was turn around and sell chops to the mob who'd done the chopping? There were a few very famous individuals who had been um, chefs, not in manners, um, but again in uh, princely households in Paris who left those households, um, went into the public food trades, and wrote cookbooks. So the famous one is somebody called Beauvillier. Um, but he actually had left the royal household already in the 1780s. So he's not pushed out of his work because of the French Revolution. Um, you could say that he's just part of this commercialization um, 
of food culture that happens in the course of the 18th century. And that commercialization happens in part due to the revolution, also in part due to some of the factors that led to the revolution, one of those being the rise of the urban middle class, the bourgeoisie, who didn't understand why the hereditary nobility and royalty should have all the fun. There's a reason we still refer to people who like the finer things and who are capable of paying for them as being bougie. I suppose I'm pretty bougie at this point, I should acknowledge. Bouginess went on the decline in France immediately after the revolution. It became quite unfashionable and indeed dangerous to flaunt one's wealth. And then this short guy named Boney came to power and got into a war against basically all of Europe. And if you had money or food, you wanted to be seen shoveling it to the army, not in your own face. There's a period of about a year in 1803 when the Treaty of Amiens uh, creates a short-lived peace across Europe. This is the time when British travelers flock to France to see what the revolution has changed. And this is when they start writing and say, oh my gosh, you'll never believe it. They have these establishments called restaurants. I guess they must have been created by the revolution not having paid attention to the servers of restorative bouillons who'd been there since the 1760s and 1770s. But the Brits loved the restaurant concept and they absorbed it and then the Brits and the French exported that concept all over the world via their respective massive empires. And back home, within France, all kinds of other older eating establishments kind of morphed into restaurants. Establishments that in an earlier vocabulary would have been called mm, estaminé or mm, traiteur all start adding the word restaurant because that becomes the familiar word. And that, of course, is the word that foreigners know. Um, so they take the word and then sometimes they take the, the the style Thank of service as Christ. well. And all oh, of that, that explains so why basically every place in the world now has restaurants. And people in those places have turned around and exported their versions of the restaurant concept as far away as Bloomington, Indiana. Your table is ready. Right this way, Monsieur. What even is the point of cooking at home? This has been a non-question for most humans because for most of human history, the only person who was gonna turn this into this into this was you. I prepare food because I want to eat. That's been all of the reasoning that most humans who've ever lived have ever needed. From our hunter-gatherer life to our agrarian life and even into much of our industrial life, the only person who was going to feed you was most likely going to be you or someone in your immediate social group. But now, for people like me living in highly developed post-industrial economies, because I want to eat is probably one of the weakest reasons for cooking, in my opinion. We live in a world where this chicken costs about the same as this chicken from the same store. And in this world, I think it really pays to interrogate why we would buy this one. Field trip to Oxford, not that Oxford, Oxford, Georgia, where Dr. Derek Shannon is a sociology professor at Oxford College of Emory University. He specializes in things like political economy and teaches a course here that's quite relevant to our discussion. The Sociology of Food course that I designed is a part of what Oxford College calls uh, our Theory Practice Service Learning Program. Part of what my students do is work here on Oxford's organic farm. Look at this place. Even in the middle of February, it's beautiful. The apple trees over here are blooming. They've got all these garlic and onions and cabbage going. But anyway, if you ask Dr. Shannon what's the point of cooking at home these days, the first thing he says is, uh, because it's an enjoyable and desirable activity. Some people like cooking, just like some people like knitting. You can go buy a sweater for cheaper than the materials that it might take. Indeed, the first good reason for cooking at home is because it's fun. This is, in my view, an unassailable reason for doing anything that isn't particularly harmful to others or particularly harmful to your long-term fun-having capacity. 
I recently put out a recipe for French macaroons in which I encouraged people to loosen their expectations about how these things should look. If you just care about how they taste and leave the cosmetics up to fate, they become as easy to make as they are delicious. But if you derive pleasure from working to create cosmetically perfect macaroons, I think that's great. You have my blessing, not that you asked for it. My argument is only this. If it's making you miserable to try to create perfectly round, smooth domes with perfect little ruffled feet, then stop. Make the ugly ones or buy the beautiful ones. Also, maybe try to think a little bit more critically about whether the things that you do really do make you happy. This is something I try really hard to do, especially with regard to my creative work. Am I struggling to make this thing because I enjoy the challenge? Good reason. Am I struggling to make this thing because I'll learn something valuable from the struggle? Good reason. Part of the reason I've spent so much time and effort trying to recreate the New York style pizza from my youth was pure curiosity. I wanted to understand on a tactile level what makes that stuff taste the way it does. Am I working to make this thing because the end product will give me joy? Good reason. I think this chicken tastes way better than this chicken. Am I going through hell to make this thing because someone will give me money for it at the end? You gotta get paid, son! Am I slaving over this thing because it will make someone else happy? Really good reason. Maybe the best reason. Am I killing myself on this thing because I think it will impress someone? Hmm, not such a good reason, in my opinion. Look, this is a conversation about the meaning of life we're having here, so reasonable people are gonna disagree. But in my view, cooking should be about nourishing and nurturing people, including yourself. It should be about giving people pleasure, including yourself. And while you might be able to make yourself happy by dazzling people with your skills, I would question whether that's in the interest of your long-term happiness or maybe your deeper, more meaningful happiness. And I would definitely wonder if it might be pleasure that you're taking at someone else's expense. This phenomenon was brilliantly crystallized in the 2010 South Park episode, Cream Frage. I can't play too much of it for you without angering the copyright gods, but you should go watch it. The Hulu link is in the description. Every time you watch cooking shows, you stay up all night trying to copy what they made. Well, I'm sorry if there's something wrong with me helping out with the cooking. Can I have a Pop-Tart? So in this instance, the harm is relatively mild, right? Randy's family is annoyed that he is flexing on them rather than providing them with the food they actually want to eat. And they're annoyed that he is filling the house with misery and stress and dirty dishes in the process. Mild harm. I do think that there's some more serious or pernicious harm associated with this phenomenon. One of the things that sociologists of food study is how a range of relations of inequality are embedded in our food supply chain. And that's not just buying, it also includes preparing, cooking, and so on. And it's not very difficult to find differentials in who has to cook and who gets to cook and when, um, who gets prestige in the act of cooking and who doesn't, and so on. Right. Who is a chef? who is a cook, and who is a food service worker. And is the difference between those people really as stark as their different social and economic statuses would indicate? I don't think it necessarily is. And I think that when we cook to display our prowess, we maybe reinforce the social attitudes that contribute toward that inequity. At the very least, we look like total tools. Uh. By the way, I want to acknowledge that I am guilty of everything I'm decrying right here. I am hardly without sin, and I am throwing stones. I'm throwing them right at myself. But anyway, if we're going to talk about potential harm to others, there's way more concrete material we can cover, right? Like, does cooking at home do more or less to damage or deplete our planet's biosphere and the people who live in it? There's an argument you could make that buying prepared foods from a store or from a restaurant is less taxing on the world's resources simply because of the economies of scale, the efficiency of mass production. Well, I mean, there's a few counter arguments. One, you know, economists oftentimes view uh, economic models as if humans are these sort of rational utility maximizing machines, and in which case then, you know, of course it's gonna be cheaper to buy something off of the dollar menu in terms of both money and time uh, than to buy an organic spread that you go home and cook, right? You know, but, but what if we talked about cooking some set of processed foods that are super soy heavy, right? The, the cost of cooking that is going to be quite different in, in energy than the cost of cooking, say, something that was organically grown on, on this farm right here. 
um, those calculations then are going to look quite different. It may be better for me to go buy an organic meal than to cook at home uh, a meal of processed goods with you know a whole lot of monocrop monocropped uh, wait what did he say there mono what you know a whole lot of monocrop sorry i just think monocrop is a pretty funny freudian slip because there's an argument that says a lot of the cheap prepared foods we buy are not cheap because they are economically or environmentally efficient to produce they're cheap because they're government subsidized, like corn. Corn is hugely subsidized here in the United States. And while there may be legitimate policy motives behind those subsidies, or totally craven political motives, it is also true that corn and similar crops are heavy on calories but light on other nutrition. And yeah, they're also the big monocrops. I mean crops. Monocrop means that you're trying to grow a single crop and you know, that form of farming is, is designed in such a way to, to kill anything that can get in the way of growing this single cash crop. Uh, that leads then to losses in biodiversity and things like that. So yeah, the environmental calculation is tough and science shows us how reality can often be very different from what you would intuitively expect. Such is the case with the sponsor of this video, HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit, whom I'll now take a minute to thank. You might suspect that all this packaging, recycled and recyclable, though much of it is, would give meal kits a bigger carbon footprint than cooking the same meal from a grocery store. But that is not true, according to a 2019 study out of the University of Michigan. This is not industry-funded research. It was paid for by the National Science Foundation. Looking at the overall supply chain, researchers found that meal kits create less greenhouse gas because the pre-portioned ingredients result in less food waste. Good reason to cook at home. It is cheaper. Is it cheaper? It absolutely can be cheaper, but it depends on what you're cooking, and it depends on how much of it you're cooking, and it depends on whether or not you're minimizing waste. Take coq au vin, chicken stewed in wine, one of the great peasant stews of French cuisine. It's a meal born of rural poverty, not of courtly opulence, as is the case with lots of other French classics. You can totally cook this at home for less money than you would pay at your local bistro, but not if you're just trying to make one or two portions. Efficiency is achieved with scale. In a restaurant, they achieve scale by making a few different dishes for a whole ton of people every night. In your kitchen, you achieve scale by making a big batch of one thing and eating many meals from it, especially if you're just feeding yourself or a small family. Or maybe you achieve scale by buying a lot of one ingredient and then making a bunch of slightly different meals from it. Regardless, you can't expect the same level of variety that you would get if you were eating out at a restaurant for every meal. And you certainly can't expect to follow every single recipe to the letter if you want to eat cheaply. Like, Coco Van is cheap to make, but not if you buy the $6 bottle of Herbes de Provence that the recipe calls for and then push it to the back of your cabinet and never cook with it again. You gotta get comfortable with using the fresh rosemary you do have instead of the Herbes de Provence you don't have. Or if you do get the Herbes de Provence, you gotta get used to the idea of down the road using it in that recipe that calls for poultry seasoning. Substitutions minimize waste, and minimizing waste saves you money. That's why good recipes don't just tell you what to do, they tell you why, thus empowering you to think for yourself. And you can be like, oh, I don't have that, but I've got this other thing that could potentially perform the same function. That's what's really going to help you to cook efficiently and to save money by cooking at home. End of home ec lecture. Let's go back to sociology class. The final and perhaps most important reason to cook your own food is to forge and maintain social bonds. Some people use the term commensality for, for people cooking and eating together. Food is related integrally to our sense of community, and in some cases our sense of identity, which might be another reason why people would choose to cook. I can cook X thing in a way and it expresses a sense of who I am and it fits the sense of taste that I was raised to develop, right? Take me for example. I am half third You should probably jump into that water. Yeah, definitely. Just kidding, pole vault!
You don't appear to be jumping in the water. No, I'm listening to a pool. Generation Italian American, half general issue Euro American mutt. That's my mom's side. I live a thousand miles from my parents and my brother and everyone I grew up with. Thanks to technological change, I live my Hold on, you just jumped in just fine. From how my grandparents yeah, it's fine. Theirs. It's just like a hot spring. Uh, it looks like it's boiling. To what? It would be very painful, I feel like. Maybe it's not quite that boiling, though. Mom, I killed a furry. Did I get a reward? Yes, you get many rewards actually. I have a bear. I did get a reward. I got a bear head. I'm a furry now. When you kill a furry, you become a furry. How awful! It's like a werewolf. their grandparents, I might as well be a freaking Martian. What keeps me clinging to the tattered shreds of a cross-generational cultural identity I have left is food. It's cooking. It's the things my dad taught me to cook. It's the things I will teach my boys to cook. The stove is the shrine where I convene with my ancestors. Laugh if you want to, but a big sloppy Italian-American red sauce is the continuity of my life. Me, my forebearers, and my descendants were all meatballs swimming in that sauce. The sauce makes me feel not so bad about being at the statistical midpoint of my life. The sauce is tangible evidence that something of my grandparents' life lives on, and that something of my life will live on. Yes, it will change, it will mutate, it will hybridize, it will adapt as it should. Hopefully it'll get better, but it will go on. Cooking gives us those connections, to say nothing of the connections that it helps us forge with other people's cultures. That's why I cook at home. Tell me why you do. Oh,
Now you're stealing moldy rocks. What have you? What muddy, have you sunk into? Muddy, muddy rocks. Moldy I'm rocks. I'm building a grave for the lady killed by the furry. Mm. Moldy rocks. Muddy rocks. They're a they're a primitive peoples. You, you can't get some nice clean rocks that aren't no. moldy. She wants it this way. She's some sort of nature spirit now. Yeah, give me the dirtiest rocks you can. Right back. Very precisely made so all the opposites are absolutely parallel, there's absolutely 90 degree angle there. Mirror, first surface mirror on all six sides, and the back one, in addition to having first surface mirror, has got patterns on it, which you see when you hold it up. But the patterns are then repeated uh, in all directions, all the way to infinity. He called it Cubos, the name Cubos, because he wanted to combine cube, which is what this is, it's a square or cube of, of, of plastic, with the word cosmos to show the majesty of the universe in a box. And that's what he's achieved in doing. So if you hold up the light which we provide, this changes the colour, which makes it read more interesting and attractive to look at. And you get so many different effects that you What are you gonna do for a break? Uh, break me off a piece of that Kit Kat bar. Fucking hands. Break me off a piece of that Kit Kat bar. No. Why not? Beta is downloaded. Oh god. Yeah, that's right. Oh god. What if the game's good? I mean, you have to tell us, I guess. I will. 
but I'm biased. I mean, you're not that biased. <laughs> there's there's definitely more biased people. It's more like PoE than Diablo Three than. It's a uh, it's a good thing. Well, yeah, I mean that's tr that's true. But uh, we'll see. If it's PoE without as much freaking garbage that makes me not want to play PoE half the time, then that'd be great. I think you like actually like Last Epic in that sense. I think I yeah. I mean, I think I would as well. Because the crafting just... the crafting system in the game is like really really. Yeah, yeah. Well, I played around with it towards the end. Um, I'm but just trying to wait until it, um... it's like ready. Oh, yeah, you know? Yeah. Because yeah. later I'm... on you get um uh, the what's it called the Tem temporal sanctum. Uh -huh. Basically, if you get um a unique with a legendary potential, you can. Basically, uh, consume uh, an exalted item, which is like a rare, uh, like a high tier rare, um, and you basically have like a random chance of getting like those rare affix affixes onto your legendary, oh. depending on how much legendary potential you have. So your uniques can basically become like, like the unique plus, you know. Crafted the way you like, you actually craft. It's basically crafting on on uniques, mm -hmm. which is pretty interesting. And um, Diablo Four has this similar system, but it's like the other way around. So like, you have a unique. But the like the uniques in Diablo 4 have like unique affixes or whatever, which is like you know, unique to the weapon or whatever. Ah. Um, and you can destroy the unique to put it onto a rare item. So it's like the other way around. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it could work either way. Just depends on how it's implemented, I guess. And if the game in general is any good. I mean, do you do you see yourself playing Last e Epic again when it uh, releases? Releases? Uh, depends on what they add. Feels pretty much complete. Minus just... like I guess any like major. I don't know. They can always add on to it after one auto, like Poe did. There's no, there's no like, feels like there's no like uber, you know, uber boss. Oh yeah. There are like bosses in like specific uh, like dungeons or whatever, but. Yeah, me and Talon did one of the. I mean, it wasn't obviously it wasn't an in-game dungeon during the beta or whatever, but we found a Talon found a key and we did one of the. Uh, the, I guess repeatable pieces of content or however that's supposed to work. Yeah, they're they're all locked by keys. Yeah, so I guess like the the rifts or whatever are the maps, and then you get keys to do the the harder thing or I guess more rewarding thing. Well, the keys are diff like they're like the thing that I talked talked about the. Uh -huh unique crafting is locked behind one of the keys. So like, uh -huh. you do those for specific shards or whatever. Chardonnays. Don't go in the, go in the thing.
I'm gonna hop off. Okay. Au revoir, mi amiibo. Went to check. Oh, Pat left. Yeah. I went to check outside to sound, and uh, there's an armadillo out there. Armadillo mon, armadigivolve too. He's gonna armadigivolve. These sea slugs have been brain slugged. Hmm, that's unfortunate. This guy is controlled by a sea slug. I can tell from the way he's got the freaking jaundice. Should I do the slug a menace? What does it give me? It seems pretty simple. Aren't you going to do all quests? Well, yeah, I'm just. It's an all should quest I, stream. Should I do it next? Is really what I meant to say. Oh, 
else to do? Rum deal. I can start Monkey Madness. Monkey Madness. I should probably not put off Monkey Madness. So I'm gonna go hang out with some monkeys. Some monkeys, yeah. Apatol is one of the most dangerous areas in the game until you obtain a monkey gree gree. I ain't afraid of no monkeys. Let's restore my prayer first. Imagine being afraid of monkeys. Imagine being mad. Because small, like monkey. All right, I'm reading. I'm reading the lore. About monkeys? The lore about monkeys, indeed, my friend. Who doesn't want lore about monkeys? Gold bar. I need an empty inventory slot. Done. I need a ball of wool. Done. And I need monkey bones, which I'm pretty sure I have those. I think I grabbed them in advance. Monkey bones. Okay. Ah, it says spring anti poison. For free healing since there's pineapple plants all around. Well, that's good. I'm not gonna bring a lock pick. Bring a ring of dueling. I can duel that. Beige. How many lobsters could I really need, honestly?
and before I become a skeleton. This one has chapters. Hello monkeys. I'm going to enjoy your madness later. Is that a is that a gate? Oh where's that how do I get in? Let me in, gnomes. You believe the can you, yeah? Can you believe the monkey madness quest is actually a gnome quest? No, not the gnomes. How the frick do I get in? Oh, there it is. Okay, <laughs> this gate was like the most hidden thing I've ever seen in my life. Grab some more, more water to of drink. For I am very thirsty.
I'm on a secret no mission. I'm truly sorry. You know, apparently the monk the gnomes are sending you to deal with the monkeys, so that's that's about right. to solve a puzzle. Does this remind you of a puzzle? My god, it's solving it for me. This is great, I hate 16 puzzles. Yeah, no, that's uh, understandable. At least I think it's trying to solve it for me. I assume those arrows aren't there naturally. Yeah, they're definitely not. It's just... I'm not sure I'm following them correctly, but I think I am.
Sure looks solved to me. She just activate the gnomish X wings. Yes. Mm. How does it feel to arm gnomes? Feels like monkeys. For a space battle against monkeys, apparently. Boom! 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 Ba -da -dum, boom! Talk to Lumdo. Oops. Okay. Try that again, but use the talk to command instead. Meanwhile, back at the ranch... in which our heroine finds herself engaging in severe quantities of monkey business. Get it? Monkeys. That was terrible. Yeah, well. All right. Oh, there's a fairy ring here. That's good to know. It says, protect, protect, turn, protect from ranged on. Okay, I can do that. Yeehaw, let's go. I've been poisoned. Drink this. Drink this. Oh god, there's a billion monkeys. <laughs> They're 
trillion monkeys. Did the monkeys just put you in jail? Appears they did. Oh! Gorilla. You've been owned by the gorilla. Come on. Yes. Got the north side of the prison. We take by level one spider. Die. Stop attacking me, level one spiders. Gorillas, can't you see the prisoner has escaped? No. But you're clearly not in the cage. The bars are see-through. You just stabbed a spider in front of him. Okay. Now's my chance. Now's my chance. Be free! Yes! I might be attacked right now. Do the monkey just teleport over to guard duty? It's a very hostile land we got here, monkeys. They appear to have a oh God, monkey version of the on one of the cities. Head west and enter the large open building during uh, via the south door. Do not stand on the light floor in the building. <laughs> okay. Instead of following the line, this guy walks by the dangerous monkey guard. Apparently. Search the stack. Search the crate for monkey denture. That do not walk on the light floor. Okay, despite these spiders need to F off. Why are they aggressive on me? They're level one. F off, spiders! God dang! So what will happen if you walk on the white light floor? I don't know, you can get sent back to prison. It's probably a trap. Huh. 
How am I supposed to do this? The, the spiders just keep talking to me. I'm haunted by spiders. <laughs> well, now you're down in the level one spider pit. Like us, do you have to make an amulet of monkey speak? Oh uh, no, I think I have to make an amulet of become monkey. Oh no. I got a mamulet mold. Teleport out to prepare for a dangerous portion. You want some energy, stamina potions, food, and prayer potions. That's good enough. I mean, I guess, I guess I'll listen to him. Got more food. I don't have any prayer potions, but I got prayer bonus stuff. Let's see, we got a holy symbol that we can equip. Highest mace. Got the blessed mace. Blessed be the ancient mace. There's a wolfbane dagger on it. Oh, five. Okay, use that. Dude, there's something sticky on my ah. Uh, How long? Uh, like three minutes. <laughs> We're talking about monkeys already. Yes, I've been making comments about monkeys. Yeah, I've heard. We, I've replied to most of your comments about monkeys. I don't know what else you've been talking about. I commented about how you, it's telling you to bring anti-poison, so that means more spiders. No, I don't need. I don't think I need anti-poisons as much for this part. Well, it tells you to bring it. Also, I said I left candy on your desk. I don't... I don't think he did. How do you think it got all sticky? Good point, that.
grab a few more lobsters. How dangerous could this be? Plus, I have a dose of prayer potion. That should be more than enough. One dose more than enough to heal any prayer that moves. Mm, it will not be enough. It's never enough. Well, the important thing is I'm carrying all my money with me. Yes, that sounds safe and sensible. Yeah, that's why I said it. Oh, I need to set up my pair of prayer flicking melee. It's arranged.
my gosh, did I make it? Who needs pots? Cowards. The lot of them. amulet. It'd be a shame if I just happened to have all of these things in my inventory already. Haha, uh -huh, yeah. Become as monkey yet? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not, not yet. Not yet. Monkey. You appear to be next to yourself. Can I heal in the duel arena? You have to duel now? No, I just want to heal. Uh, let's see. OSRS. Heal in duel arena. Uh. They have a they have an altar somewhere. No, this place is worthless. Okay, I'm fine. With this, I'm going home. Right, let's let my run energy recharge because apparently we're in for another another slugfest here, I guess. Kill a monkey guard for a gorilla GG later. Oh. Thank you. 
Grab some more lobbies. And Oops. Try to snag some kills while we're there on these mobs. When are you upgrading from lobsters? I I have swordfish, but I'm stingy. Mm. You need to understand. Please understand. from range ready here we go of course I got poisoned on the first hit whoops did not mean to aggro that spider or that snake Stop draining my prayer. I'm not. I'm not praying.
Mr. Grill? Yeah, he's leaving. Okay. You know what, monkey? Monkey see, monkey freaking die. spot this guy somehow. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Alright, looks like the answer might be yes. Nope, the answer's not yes. Safe spot, monkey, guard, OSRS. <laughs> the southwest corner. to think it would be that easy. Oh. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Do you need to kill a monkey zombie? Got him in some sort of infinite. I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure how he save spotted, but you know what? I'll freaking take it. He appears to be next to a raging inferno. I'll take it. Literally will not complain about this.
boats. No, grab the boats. Well, let me climb up the goddamn ladder. I'm trapped? I'm not trapped. Okay. Just, just get, get me out of this room. Get me out of this room. Put my prayer runs out. Oh, there's a monkey altar. Oh, okay, let's go pray at that. Restore my prayer points. Free prayer. Stop running at him. Why can't you hit him from here? Okay, surely you can hit this monkey from here. Yeah, alright. We, ladies and gentlemen, we got him! <laughs> it, took, it took me an eternity to figure out a safe spot this guy, but I was not leaving here to come back later to kill this guy later. I NEED MY MONKEYS DEAD NOW! said this would be a fast kill. Muffled monkey noises. Hmm. <laughs> 
Oh, come on, get him. Get the monkey. Yeah, there we go. Okay, see ya! Stupid monkeys. Alright. What's attacking me? Level 1 spider. F off. I'm trying to strategize here. Alright, I need to find where where's bananas. I also need to equip my M speak amulet. Alright. To the west of that building there should be a banana garden that has a monkey child in it. Okay. Wait, how did I get poisoned? Well that's somewhat inconvenient. Talk to the monkey. I'm just going to wait for the on to patrol just to be safe.
Get out of the shoe, shoe, go away, Auntie. Yeah, that's right, get the frick out of here. Don't talk to monkey. That's not what I want. Go away, Aunt. Shoo. Shoo. Get lost. Talk to the monkey. bananas and monkey themed have you become monkey yet no I have to talk to this monkey two more times so I can become monkey for for monkey for monkey them the monks man Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Ollie, Ollie's outie. <laughs> All right. Oh, my prayers basically still max starting. Um, whatever, we'll restore it again. We have to walk through that hellscape again. <laughs> the, the cave of eternal nightmares. But that's okay. I'm not owned. I'm not owned! Let's get back our holy symbol. Get back our knife of praying.
get some of that curry. Where's, where did I put that curry? this M amulet mold anymore. No, I don't. Okay. Ah, put these away. I think we still have all of our printer bonus stuff on. Oh, we can, um... I just realized we have some energy potions. I should probably use those. Make this affair a little bit swifter. Okay. All right. more run through hell and then I think we're basically done. I don't have an anti-poison so that's not ideal but I wanted my inventory full of food. We'd, if I were me, I would just simply not get poisoned before I go downstairs. Mentally, mentally prepared myself. Okay, got my pray, pray for melee on. Dude, I can't click this letter! Oh my god! Nope, I have to leave. I got poisoned. Oh my god, I'm frustrated. I got poisoned because I couldn't click the ladder. The game literally just wouldn't let me click it. 
Whatever, I'll bring an anti-poison. I'll get all my food. Yeah, I don't need this knife. There. I was reading about the final battle. <laughs> All right, here we go. Well, nice to use a few of those energy potions. I've been having much, much of a use for them. After I made them all those years ago. F off, zombie monkeys.
a one spider you can F right off all the way. Where, where, what happened to my monkey talisman? Okay, never mind. But this something weird is going on. I played this cutscene like it's twice. It's my monkey talisman now. Is it because I clicked the X? Yeah. Yes, I never want to come through this cave again, dude. You will make me all the talismans I require. And do not, do not give me any lip. Do not ask me any questions. Talismans, get me the frick out of here again. Peace out. Zombie and Gorilla Grinchy. A few more 
lobbies. Alright. Oh no. Frick. Oh, this is fine. I'm not owned. Don't read it in the newspaper. Hello, newspaper? Ivan's been owned. Rented. No. No. I just said I haven't been owned. You can't prove anything. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to rescue a monkey from the zoo. Me, monkey. Let me out of here. I do not want to become a monkey. It was a it was a ruse. I was the monkey all along. I have a monkey in my inventory and I'm not afraid to use it. Oof. The monkey is gone. I cannot teleport with the monkey in my inventory. Do not ask questions. That's highly annoying. <coughs> I've lost the monkey. This guy lost the monkey. He's gone. He's just gone! I have to walk by foot. The Noma Stronghold. How far of a walk is that? Uh, it's not that far, I guess. Where's the monkey binder? Ook ook. Gotta walk on out of here.
has a monkey in their inventory right now. No, I hate monkey. Oh. You're not a monkey, are you? Mm, no, I just pretend to be a monkey. That's a joke. Me. Funny monkey. Look at dancing monkey. Hee hee hee. Sounds like something a monkey in disguise would say. Funny monkey. Funny monkey! Ook ook eek eek! I monkey. All right, do spider attack monkey? Surely not. Nope. Just a friendly little monkey. Nothing hurts me anymore. Snakes? Oh, no, it's snakes never eat a monkey. Ooh, You're ooh, so eek. freaking eaten by snakes. Nope. I'm, inv I'm invincible. That is a really good reward to give, like, uh... As you get further in the quest, this, this hostile, poisonous, treacherous area. And now, you just be become monkey. Mm. And everything is your friend because you have become monk. Look at all these monks. I'm friends, monk. God dang, I just waltz through here too. No one stop monkey. Look, monkey, I'm I'm solving the quest as fast as I can. Just just work with me here. No, solve it faster. Dude, the character pathing loves to get stuck on gorilla. <sighs> Why are these monkeys so militant? Who hurt them in the past? Who has battered and who has battered and bruised these monkey?
Dude, sometimes the path thing is really good. Like, I just clicked on that high spot. I, I had no idea how to get up here. But my character just navigated to the path. As long as there's nothing in your way. The pathfinding seems, like, really freaking good. Talk to Kruk, to wielding monkey ninja. Meanwhile, back on the apes. You're an ape. What the heck? The Monkey King is scheming with the evil gnomes! He would. Monkey Madness for the final battle. All right, let's uh, monkey out of here. Oh, I can't. Um, I can't cast magic as a monkey. Hmm. Let me go to uh, last man standing. Drink from the sippy. Take a sippy from the well. Get my ranged equipment and get ready to shoot a demon.
You know, not not ranged magic. Did I set up magic? I meant to. Okay, yeah. All right. Away, keep the prayer potion and the anti poison, put the stream dueling away from now. Uh, what other stuff am I forgetting? This and this. Might as well equip a cape. Get my Freeman cape. Delightfully devilish, Ivan. Okay. I'll get my prayer book back because I think the prayer bonus would be better. Bolts. Uh, let's bring some more curries. Some more of these bastards. Do I have any ranging potions? New. No. Alright. Well then, I don't think any of that matters. Let's get more food. Come on, gnomes, get him! There we go. We've kited him into the, the true battle strategy. Death by gnome! worried about my prayer running out, but this guy's range defense is not as high as I was expecting, to be honest. The gnomes are also, like, chipping, <laughs> chipping them away.
think I have to land like the actual final hit here. Maybe I need to kite him away from the gnomes now. So I can kill him. There we go. And I did have to use a dose of the prayer potion, but I don't think that's a big deal at all. What the heck? <laughs> Teleported me in the middle of poisons! <laughs> get me, get me out of here! <laughs> Try to trying to freaking kill me! Oh my god. Why would it, why would it do that? Why would it do that to me? will die. Um, right, let's keep my greegees on me here. can't believe how unlucky I got. Like, I was chunking him, and then when it came time where I had to get the killing blow, I just, like, <laughs> missed three times, and the gnomes were like, what if we killed him for you? And it's like, no, this, this isn't how it works, apparently. <laughs> I don't know why. Huge stack of gold and several diamonds. Congratulations on your huge stack of diamonds. But more importantly, more importantly, let's get a bunch of XP. Defense, please. Hopefully, this takes me to freaking 60 attack so I can use the true reward here, which is a dragon scimitar.
this. What have the monkeys got for sale? Need monkey goods? General store is kind of boring. But this guy's got the Rune Skimmy Tour. I would like one of those, please. Yes, yes. What else do they have here? There's not all that much to do here now that I've got the dragon scimitar. But I mean, that's that's a pretty big, it's a pretty big, uh, not much to do after. Hmm. How much does he sell for? Oh, that seems normal price. I'm gonna steal, I'm gonna steal from his monkey stall. The heck? Wait, why can't I steal from the stall? Stealing is wrong. Stole from the general stall. All right. Well, screw you guys. I'm going home. I got my dragon scimitar. That's all I care about. figure out what the best way to get out of here is actually uh, maybe just go over here equip my greedy and teleport to Lumbridge They don't know I've completed Monkey Madness 1. The D semi. Let's compare this to the rune semi. Okay, it's like it's like fifty percent better. That's pretty nuts, actually. Cause the rune scimitar is already pretty strong. Seal anymore after that. 
All right, well that's a good stopping place for tonight. That was that was one of like the the big boy quests. It's a terrible stopping place. And then I should probably start on recipe for disaster soon, because that's the next big boy quest, and it even requires uh even requires this stuff. Anyway, see you train, bye!